We have a very distinguished audience here today, and uh, it's wonderful to see everybody networking and getting to know each other, because I'm sure you'd all agree that we care deeply about our country and we want to keep moving it forward. And so today we're going to talk about a lot of things, the state of our country, the state in many uh, respects, the world. And we also want to talk about a person named Conrad Black. Mm. And we're delighted that Lord Black is with us. And uh, this is going to be uh, quite a far-reaching conversation, isn't it, Conrad? Yeah, that's up to you, Dan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've known each other and we consider not only Conrad Black a friend of Frontier, but also a friend personally. So I really do appreciate that friendship. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. Well, look, Lord Black, you um, had a very interesting life to date. In Best terms, is yet to come. <laughs> in terms of both business, when you think of it strategically, in terms of um, leading um, many different business enterprises on a very large scale, you've also led one of the largest media conglomerates, uh, I think one of the, the third largest in history at one point. The newspaper company. The yeah. newspaper company, Hollinger. Uh, you've also been an author of a number of very interesting best-selling books from, as I recall, Morris Duplessy to FDR to Nixon. That's mm -hmm. probably one of my favorite books on, on Nixon. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, The Manifesto, A Vision for Canada, uh, Return to Greatness. And so you've walked in a lot of areas and you continue to be an outspoken voice. How many columns are you featured in these days, including the Epoch Times? Uh, th three a week. So as we look at that broad career, what, what would you say to someone who says, well, how have you been so successful? Is there a, a core secret or principle that's enabled you to have success in so many areas of life? It's a very flattering question. But look, there are lots of successful businessmen and, and, and you know, I wouldn't, uh, I, I would say I, well, I was, if, I'm, if I may, I was a good newspaper publisher because we raised the quality of the publications and we made quality profitable. It is a myth that to be, in the old days when the newspaper industry was really a buoyant industry financially, which it is not now, but in those days it was always a fraud and a cop-out to say that in order to make money in it, you had to produce mediocre or scurrilous newspapers. That was never true. And, and uh, the fact is anyone who reads a broadsheet newspaper, I'm, again, I'm going back 20 or 30 years when it was a much stronger industry, anyone who did was what's called an ABC1 reader, a high education, high income reader, exactly who the advertisers want. And they don't care within reason what the cover price is. So if you really put quality in the paper, you could raise the cover price a bit and, and, you, and you could sell it to the advertisers because these are the people I want. These are the people with the high incomes. And, and I, it, it, it was really not a well-managed industry because very few people could blend together the requirements of producing a good newspaper product. It's not like producing toothpaste or something. You've got to be very careful. You know, there's subtleties culturally about how you do it and, and sociologically. And, and, and combine that with good management. I, I mean, Rupert Murdoch has done it, and, and a few others, but very few. Very hi interesting historical perspective. I want to talk a little bit more about the state of media, but I did want to shift to the topic of Canada as a nation. You've, you've reflected an awful lot about its history. Can you tell us more about the founding of Canada as a significant Western nation and the genius that went into that, or was it just all an accident? No, no, it was not an accident. And <clears throat> I think, and I, I, I would be surprised if many of you disagreed with me, I don't think as a people we know our history well. And I think we have in some respects been, not deliberately, but accidentally, somewhat intimidated by our proximity to the United States. 
the fact is, Canada had to begin as a French operation, otherwise it would have just been assimilated into the American colonies. And it had ultimately to cease to be French because the strategic division in Europe was the French had the great army and the British had the great navy. So the British took what they wanted across the seas and the French only got Britain's leaving. So the British took India and North America and France got North Africa and Indochina. They're important places, but they're not comparable. And, uh, but it had to cease to be French and become British at the time that the Americans ceased to be British. Otherwise, again, we would have been brought into the, you know, sort of sucked into the United States into, as they became. And we needed the protection of the British from the Americans, and by the skin of our teeth, we preserved Canada in the War of 1812. Um, uh, 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 but And we, we needed that so we couldn't agitate for our liberty too vigorously or the British would have washed their hands of us and said, well, this is just more trouble than it's worth. We'll sell it. It was, a, it was very few people in this vast area. We'll just sell it to the Americans they want it anyway and they can, they can pay for it somehow, you know. And uh, so it, it took a great skill, not evidently heroic skill, but great skill for Baldwin and Lafontaine and MacDonald and Cartier to convince the British that Canadians should have the same civic rights as the British and the Americans, so we should elect our leaders. Uh, and, and, and it was very skillful the way they did it. And we managed to turn this to account by saying to the British, look, you see there is a problem here, you have to give us our rights but you also see that the great majority of Canadians are loyal to the British Crown, so you've got to reward us. I and mean, a lot of our people, a very large number of them, are, are people who fled the U.S. because they were loyal to the British Crown. It, it, was, it, it isn't easy to portray it like Patrick Henry saying, give me liberty or give me death or Paul Revere's ride. I mean, mind you, three quarters of American uh, uh, you know, hagiography in their, in their history is just rubbish. They're great men, we're very great men, but a lot of these secondary figures are nothing to write home about. Uh, but, but the Americans have, as we all know, the genius of the star system in every field. So they, some of their stars really are and some of them are frauds, but that's, that's America. But it, it, we had to do it quite differently. And we got into this habit of being always quieter and convincing ourselves we were kinder and gentler than the Americans. I, I wouldn't put too much freight on that wagon. In some ways, yes, in some ways not, but I think we're much more envious than the Americans. But, but that's how we had to proceed, and, and it wasn't easy. And it is easy to think it was easy, but it wasn't. It, was, it took great skill, and our statesmen were very skilled. Even a man like Mackenzie King. Now, this, this, those of you who have, or, I, there'd be very few people in the room who would remember him, but I'm sure many of you know a fair bit about it, but nowadays he is, you know, he is an absurdly inadequate figure in the company of Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt and Charles de Gaulle. I mean, and he wasn't them. I'll, I'll, I'm not going to you know, pretend, I'm not going to try and sell you the idea he was a peer of those three, but he was an extremely intelligent man and he was very successful. And he got us through World War II without the, the terrible abrasions we had in World War I. And we mounted a tremendous war effort in this country for a country of only 11 million people. At the end of the war, we had the third navy in the world. Now, I'll admit that that's because the, the Americans and the British sank all the other navies. But still, it, it, was, uh, it, it, was, uh, it, it was a terrific performance and an almost entirely volunteer performance. And, you know, we are now a country that has a population almost identical to what France had in the latter 19th century, which is, you know, fin de siècle. It's often thought of as the golden age of France, the time of Victor Hugo and Emile Zola and Renoir and great, great artists, great writers, uh, just a, uh, where Paris was a, the city of light. We, we mustn't deceive ourselves. We don't have quite the um, attainments culturally and not the historical background of France, but this could be one of the world's greatest countries. And it wouldn't take more than five years of serious government before it was recognized as that. The world is ready for us, but are we ready for it? I say we are, but I, you know, we're all waiting for it.
Wow, what a terrific challenge. <laughs> In terms of Canada, we have everything going for us, coast to coast to coast, on so many fronts, including incredible people. Um, one of the measures or marks of a country, as you know, is per, per capita GDP, the gross domestic product. Um, how are we doing? The last time well, I Well, comparatively not well. I mean, com you know, it is still a, one of the world's relatively rich countries, but I think we're, I mean, I'm one of the more venerable people in the room, but when I was young, um, we were only behind the United States. If you, if you leave out, uh, in those days, tax haven states like Monaco, which is, you know, there are only a few thousand people there. Uh, and, and nowadays, if, if you leave out tax haven states, there are a few more of them, like Luxembourg and, and the Petro states, like Kuwait, or even, I mean, I'd accept Norway as an integrated economy, but really, basically, oil, small oil producing countries, so the income is very high for the population. It, on that basis, we were, we were only second to the United States when I was young, and we were in that position for a long time, and, and we're, we're, you know, we have, we're, we have all kinds of countries that are inexplicably ahead of us. I mean, I think we're now 26, where if present trends continue, in the next two or three years, we'll be passed by South Korea, Israel, and the Czechs. Now, you know, I remember, this is how old I am, I remember when the ceasefire was signed in Korea in 1953 after President Eisenhower threatened to use atomic weapons on the communist Chinese, and they got the message and signed the ceasefire. And at that time, all Korea, the entire peninsula, was a rubble heap. There was, they, they, there, were, there was almost nothing standing. The armies had gone up and down the peninsula. The whole country was destroyed. It was primitive to begin with. They had no sophisticated manufacturing. They didn't, they didn't make a car. They hardly hard, had any cars. Uh, and, and they certainly didn't have shipyards. They, they didn't have anything, and they were about to pass us. Israel, when it was, I mean, I don't remember it, but I was alive when it was founded, and it was, to quote, to give you a quote from Pontius Pilate, it was a land of sand, camels, and Jehovah, and that's all there was in Israel. And look at it now. Now, you know, they, they, they came off a narrow base, so you can, if you do it properly, it can grow very quickly. So it's not a totally fair comparison. But, but the Netherlands is a more prosperous country per capita than we are. As you all know, it's a very small country. It's a lot of reclaimed land. They have practically no natural resources. They have the great port of Rotterdam, but they're industrious people. And they, it was liberated by our first Canadian army in World War II, and it was at that time a, a wreck. I mean, the, you know, the, the German and Allied armies had gone right through it, firing heavy ammunition at each other, and the country was terribly heavily damaged. And they have, I mean, God bless them, I admire them for it, but why have they caught us? Why have they been advancing more quickly than we are when this country is, a, as I was just discussing it with, with uh, Thor Richardson, uh, just, you know, just during lunch. Uh, we are a treasure house. We have every resource except tropical fruit. We even grow a few bananas near Niagara Falls. We, are, we, are, we have every resource. All energy, forest products, precious metals, base metals, everything. And we're ashamed of it. And we're losing ground to countries who don't have a fraction of our natural advantages. Did you mention oil and gas? I said energy. <laughs> uh, uh, our leading industry upon which we are, we are, in effect, conducting war from the federal government. It's a, it's, a, it's a scandalous state of affairs. So how do we turn the corner well, and you, move you, this You nation? change governments, don't you? I mean, <laughs> the, the crowd seems to agree with you. I think it's going to happen, too. Um, on that note, um, we are very concerned about a prosperity agenda for this country. So that was a very powerful summation, and it's very humbling, isn't it? to compare to those other nations. It begs all the questions that you ask. Well, I, I'm, I respect all those countries, certainly, but, but they should not be more prosperous than we are. Right. So speaking of prosperity at Frontier, we would say all Canadians 
have an opportunity to prosper, including our brothers and sisters in the Aboriginal community. Sure. And we're very concerned about that. Um, in January, there's a leader of the opposition who is here at Frontier. Mm -hmm. We had a packed audience. That was, you asked me, it was interesting, Conrad, when Peter Hawley asked the question about the size of audiences, who was the largest? Conrad uh, mm -hmm. leaned over and asked me, and I said, mm -hmm. it was the leader of the opposition. Oh, you know, you're, you're right to come up in greater numbers for okay. him than for me. I, <laughs> okay. so, I would have made the same choice. <laughs> but, but in a powerful speech, he did challenge everyone. And this is consistent with Frontier's vision. So we need to get rid of the Indian Act. Of course. And I, I want to salute this organization, uh, David. And you, in particular, I, I understand Judge Giesbrecht is here. And, and uh, Mr. Clifton is here. The, uh, that... Uh, book about the Truth and Reconciliation Report was one of the, in fact, I can't think of a rival, but there may have been one, but, but so because I can't think of it, I, I won't go all the way in this, but it is the greatest single contribution I know of that any think tank has ever made to the enlightenment of this country. Uh, and I salute you. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, if those of you who read the National Post, my piece in the National Post, drawing heavily on uh, remarks you have helped to circulate, David, you in front here, from Jacques Rouillard, emeritus professor from the University of Montreal, uh, to expose this utter fraud, this scandalous self-defamation, a kind of self-directed blood libel that our government has generated that Canada is somehow a nation of genocidists. I mean, this is unbelievable. And we're being criticized by the Chinese who are, you know, the, the, this Chinese communist regime is in terms of number of people killed, the most criminal in all of history. And they are criticized, and at this moment they have over a million Uyghurs illegally detained and they've subdued their birth rate by 60%, which is genocide, by the way, and, and, uh, and they are criticizing us in the United Nations for our civil rights record. I am not whitewashing our treatment of the natives. We should have done better, and I think most Canadians would agree with that. But what we were trying to do was assimilate them because we thought that that was what was best for them and what they wanted. We may have been mistaken in some of that. I'm certainly not mistaken in a lot of it. I, I'm not, as I said, I'm not trying to defend everything we did, but to call it genocide? Mm -hmm. It was incompetence. It might even have been racial arrogance of a kind that was quite widespread in the colonial era. But it, 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 almost nothing that we ever did with the Native people was other than well-intended. And, uh, and how our government has made us regarded by Amnesty International, or essentially a bunch of commies that they occasionally do good works, uh, as in, in some measure in the same camp as the, as the Nazis or Pol Pot or the Turkish massacre of over a million Armenians at the end of the First World War. How can our government possibly defend itself for what it did in this respect? It's an outrage. Okay, so in this context... And, and I, I want to salute the Frontier College for leading the, the comeback to get the truth out so that we all can sleep peacefully at night knowing that our grandparents or great-grandparents weren't a bunch of, of Nazis or Nazi equivalents. Well, but, but yeah. So, so well said. And at, at Frontier, I'd say we're in passionate, as I think every Canadian is, about trying to get at the truth of history in a balanced way to move towards reconciliation, which is a very ambiguous concept, but if it means prosperity and opportunity for everyone, count everybody in. But what you see now is a lot of claims, even about mass graves. It's, it's awful. And, and so uh, of which not one has been discovered, as you know, and as, right. as you have published. And the people I mentioned are, are, are the ones who've done this. I'm, I'm just echoing what others have said, but I'm trying to get it out there. And you know, get, get, I, mean, I think the average Canadian, not hearing the counter-argument, right. actually believes that there are 
thousands and thousands of effectively murdered native children who were got rid of in mass graves that, 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 that were plowed over so they didn't look like cemeteries. No, there's no truth in any of that sense, nothing. Not one scintilla of truth in any of it. Yeah. And, and so this is urgency for action where there should be proper forensic investigation by proper third parties like any other... They point. voted $27 million in June, I believe, of last year precisely to get to the bottom of this thing because it, you know, the, the origin of it was this uh, subterranean radar that d d the detected sort of disturbances, you see. That's what they were called. And they could be just anomalies of roots of trees and things. You know, it's only a few feet under the ground. $27 million, and they haven't dug up one of them yet. I mean, they, the myth, this satanic myth, is far more convenient for the native victimhood industries than actually spending 1% of the money that was voted to do a little digging. You could do it with less than I had to pay two people to dig out a cat that had fallen down a drain pipe in my house. You wouldn't need any more than that, and you could find out if, if there was a grave there. Right. So, so there's urgency <coughs> to get to the truth to this, and, and why is that so important for us as a nation when you think of this strategically, Conrad? The whole question of the status of the natives at the time of the arrival of the Europeans is, is complicated, and it has to be clarified. Unfortunately, I think we are, if we, if we don't do anything about it, we can see the more outspoken native leaders, the, the leaders of the, you know, the militant victimhood advocates, progressing towards saying that what the French and British explorers and settlers did coming to Canada was qualitatively indistinguishable from what Hitler and Stalin did to Poland. That they came here, invaded the natives' country, took it over, and subjugated the natives. And that is bunk. There were 200,000 natives in all of the three million square miles of what is now Canada. The only places where they had permanent structures were in the far west, uh, Vancouver Island, and, and a little bit in the Ottawa Valley. And that was the only place where they had agriculture, where they actually grew crops. For the rest, uh, they, they had no fabrics, they had animal skins, and they were nomads. They moved around. They were tremendously skilled. Uh, they, were, they were remarkably capable people. But it was, a, it was a Stone Age civilization. They hadn't invented the wheel, and they had no written language. And they're not inferior people. I believe all people are equal. But it was an inferior society. And the settlers and explorers who came here, for all of the barbarities that went on in Europe at that time, were emissaries of the civilization of Shakespeare and uh, Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Montaigne and uh, 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 you know, the great uh, towering intellectual and cultural figures in, in, in the history of, of the world. And, and they found a culture where the, the natives were extremely sophisticated at what they did. They were wonderfully agile and uh, they make these remarkable canoes that could carry much more than their own weight and things. But it was a, it was a society that was 5,000 years behind Western Europe. And, we, and there's, there's nothing to be embarrassed about in that, but we shouldn't be papering that over and allowing these people to get away with the idea that we invaded a sophisticated country that was fully adequately populated by natives and just stole their country. There's no truth in that. And, but if we don't state the truth, that is going to become the truth. And, and so, you know, I, I think we have to say, we have to make the facts plain in a way that is not dismissive of the natives at all, but, but is not overly respectful of the sophistication of the civilization they had because they were isolated in a way that Europe was not. And with that, we, we, have, I, we have to start all over again. You're right, the Indian Act is rubbish. The numbered treaties, rubbish, throw them all out. And, uh, and uh, your recommendations, I think, are, are, are excellent. I mean, I focus particularly on those who wish to make their way in the life of the country generally must be assisted very generously to do that. 
Those who want to maintain a native style of living, I, I guess they have that right and we should encourage it, but it, it is, I think you had a phrase in your report uh, of phasing out the, the small <clears throat> native communities and, and, and I think we want to amalgamate them, not herding people around compulsorily, but in, you know, incentivizing them to move into larger units so that you know, they are comprehensive and, and have the facilities to, to deal with a community which, you know, in smallish communities like that in the dark of winter can be quite depressive. And, and there, we all are aware of these problems of alcoholism and uh, high suicide rates and so on. We want to help them out of that too. And those who want to maintain a, a, a native style but with the benefit of, you know, modern appurtenances, we, I think we can work towards that. But we aren't getting anywhere. I mean, the billions and billions we pour out, a lot of it is, goes in, in, frankly, the corruption of some of the officials, native officials. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the, the truism is still there. A lot of these places don't have drinking water that, that you can be confident drinking unless you boil it first. And there's no excuse for that with all the money we put into this. We've just got to do it better. But instead of sitting down with the native leaders, and some of them are outstanding people, brilliant people. I've met a number of them. Sitting down with them and working out something that's fair and generous, and we can all watch it grow and succeed and be proud of it, and be, and be happy for them, uh, we're defining reconciliation as uh, slandering and libeling our own ancestors. Exactly. When well, well, what kind of reconciliation is that? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you, Conrad Black, for joining us here for this very far-reaching conversation, for inspiring us with your insights, for challenging us, and for also sharing something about your personal story. And we want to thank you for your leadership and your courage and for joining us here today. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.